there's probably three or four points in our better booch career where we hit a fork in the road that was like are we doing this or not you know and the first of which was about six months into the farmers markets at the time we were actually the only thing we could either find or afford was a time slot at a commercial kitchen that we rented but the only shift was like midnight to 3 a.m so we would drive up to like santa clarita with our tea and like bottle from midnight to 3 a.m and we quickly grew out of that space so within six months we had to find our own space and we did find a space you know it turns out the commercial kitchen was misadvertised to us nothing was done to code and we had to redo the whole thing which basically ate all of our savings by the time we actually had our license and could operate out of it we had no more money <laughs> so we were basically like starting from dead zero this is Startup to Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Trey Lockerbie, co-founder of the kombucha brand Better Booch. Trey's first experience with kombucha was an unpleasant one on many levels. His sister was going through treatment for breast cancer and trying everything under the sun, including kombucha. Trey tried it and hated it, but couldn't quite shake the thought from his mind that it could be better. After a few years and a whole lot of tinkering with recipes, Trey and his wife Ashley took their booch to a local farmer's market where it was an instant hit. But just because they had a better product doesn't mean that the journey to becoming a nationally distributed brand was all sunshine and rainbows. So listen in as we cover everything from why they never set out to conquer the world with their brand, why the kombucha market is nowhere near its full potential, and how being an investor in other people's companies makes you a better owner of your own company. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Trey, founder of Better Booch. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. This Thanks is for having me. Nick's favorite drink, legitimately of all time. Is that right? yeah. So I, this I was is uh, at a music fans. festival uh, a couple years ago. I was working it, and in the artists' lounge, uh, they had a kombucha display with like three or four different types of kombucha, and I I tried them all over the course of the weekend. And yours stood out head and shoulders above the rest. I think it was like Brew Doctor, maybe like some like Health Aid or whatever. And later on, I found myself in a Whole Foods and I was looking to buy a kombucha. And I saw your brand again. And so the first thing I, I kind of do when I look at drinks that I like, I'm like, all right, how much sugar is in this? And comparing the sugar content of all the kombuchas in that store yours was below yeah. everyone else absolutely and so i was like oh okay it's actually living up to the name yes and i can feel good about drinking this yes because i'm not just overloading with my body with sugar yeah it's probably obvious but being better booch we try to do everything better <laughs> everything <laughs> yeah. the better way absolutely so and part of that sugar content is fairly easy to understand once you kind of grasp that most of the other brands are adding juices to their kombucha for flavor. And all of our kombucha is tea-based. So teas, herbs, botanicals, adaptogens. So it's actually more authentic and traditional yeah. as far as kombucha goes. And uh, whereas a lot of the other brands are almost like fermented juice, you know, in that, in that regard. What made you want to start the company? What was like the, the problem you were solving? Or maybe you were just a fan of kombuchas i wasn't a fan of kombucha funny enough me neither um, <laughs> so <laughs> until yours and then yeah. this is not this sounds like a plug but it's not like nick put me onto this and i was like i don't like kombucha yeah and then he got me this one specifically the sage and i was like this is amazing yeah so the story goes a little bit where uh my sister who got diagnosed with breast cancer very early on in her early 20s tried everything you know chemo radiation tons of different surgeries and it really wasn't until she went to germany to get some treatment she couldn't get in the US and, and it was more of a immunology kind of treatment. So full body overhaul of nutrition and everything else. And they put her on a diet and it included kombucha. And she started being like, wow, this is, uh, this is actually making me feel really great. And so she was telling me all about it and raving and, and I started looking into it. And What year was this? This is 2011, probably. Actually, probably 2010. Because uh, yeah, my experience was going to a store and I bought the only brand that there was at that time. And I pulled into my driveway actually and, and opened it up and it over foamed and exploded on me and poured on my lap. And I like ran inside and it foamed basically half of it down the sink. And then I tasted it and it tasted like dirt water. And I was like, okay, what the hell is this? Um, 
and I kind of swore off kombucha to be honest since then, but she was very adamant about the benefits. And so I was eager to like make it work. Uh, I was just really intrigued by it. So I learned how to brew it myself and I figured, okay, well, I like peach tea. I like some other things that I drink very often. And maybe if I make a kombucha with that, it would taste better. And that was the first light bulb that went off is when I've tried my own kombucha and uh, had tinkered around with how to brew it. It was so good that I was like, oh my God, everyone would drink this if they knew it's supposed to taste good. I didn't know kombucha was supposed to taste good. Right. You know, you're like, hey, would you like to try some homemade kombucha? And the first thought is no. no. How do I say no in the most firm but polite way possible? Yeah. And that's, there's a lot of reasons for that too. A lot of people over ferment their kombucha. It becomes very vinegary, et cetera. But what we were tasting at home was way better and hence the name, Better Booch. And yeah. we, we thought, you know, my wife and I at the time, we were both touring musicians. So we were kind of at our wits end with the touring life a little bit and we're looking to kind of pivot and and do something more domestic you know we starting to date and everything you don't want to be gone all the time and we uh you know eventually wanted to have a family and do other things and said okay music is not gonna really allow for that so we were looking for something else and honestly we didn't set out to conquer the world or anything we really just wanted to sell at farmers markets and make some side income and and it really is actually quite a feat to even show up at a farmer's market, which I think is surprising to most people. I kind of thought you would just rock up to one and be like, hey, I've got some stuff to sell. And they'd be like, cool, grab a tent. But that's not how it works at all. In LA, especially, it's kind of like the mafia. You have to like, get in and, and I can like, see that. yeah, it's there's a lot of bureaucracy around it, et cetera. And we had to make the product in a commercial kitchen and all these things. So by the time we showed up, we were pretty invested and ready to go. And then we sold out and then we went back the next week, sold out and it just kept baking more. And then it just slowly consumed our livelihood. And here we are. Were you guys like a group in the, like, were you guys working together as musicians? No, actually. So my wife, uh, she was primarily a background singer for Rihanna. So she spent four years with her all over the world. And I was more on the like singer songwriter route. So uh, a lot of LA based songwriters I, I toured with, including my own music. And then this artist named Lenka out of Australia, I did a lot of international stuff with. And so, yeah, we got, I mean, it was an amazing opportunity because we got to see the world and get paid for it and be in our early twenties and have some savings. And well, I dropped out of college and she went to a conservatory. So neither of us had like college debt and that so helps. we were in a really good position to kind of like take a risk and yeah. you know, start a business. When you said the farmer's market thing, I had a company at one time and we had, I remember we had to wait for a cancellation. Like someone had to cancel their yeah, tent Yeah, it was probably like a year long wait list or something yeah. too. And then that's how we got to show up. And then the woman running it was like, if you guys are nice, we'll invite you back. And I was like, what? Like we have to be, which we obviously were planning to be nice, but it was course, weird that yeah. that's how she presented it. Like if we like you, yeah. you'll be invited back to next week. And it was like our car was full and we had the super small car and it was like full of like the tent and the yeah. weights. And we had to learn like, oh, there's wind. So we need weights. And you, then if it rained, this was in Boston. And so it was like different factors. Oh, or if yeah. the weather's not good, nobody's showing up to this thing. But I remember that. I remember like she was very territorial about us just being on the list. Yeah. You wouldn't believe the... Uh you know, the feedback from our friends. I mean, they were like, you're doing what? Like we were <laughs> set up at a farmer's market selling tea and they're like, you quit Rihanna to do this? Like what, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, a lot of people thought we were crazy. At Rihanna's the, the latest billionaire. Yeah. She's doing, she's According. doing great. Okay. So then things are going well at the farmer's market. Yeah. And now you're thinking like, okay, let's scale. Or are you thinking? Yeah. So we kept, there's probably three or four points in our better booch career where we hit a fork in the road that was like, are we doing this or not? You know, and the first of which was about six months into the farmer's markets. At the time, we were actually, the only thing we could either find or afford was a time slot at a commercial kitchen that we rented, but the only shift was like midnight to 3 a.m. So we would drive up to like Santa Clarita with our tea and like bottle from midnight to 3 a.m. And we quickly grew out of that space. So within six months, we had to find our own space. And we did find a space. It was advertised to us as a commercial kitchen and uh, they wanted a two-year lease minimum. And so that was one of the fork in the road that we were like, okay, two years, geez, that's a, that's a big commitment. You know, like, let's, are we really doing this or are we, but you know, are we not? So we were like, yeah, let's do it. So we signed it, you know, turns out the commercial kitchen was misadvertised to us. It was, uh, nothing was done to code. And it, it was, I think it was a cannabis facility beforehand or something that they didn't tell us. And 
So it was all very like, we had to redo the whole thing, which basically ate all of our savings. And then by the time we actually had our license and could operate out of it, we had no more money. <laughs> so we were basically like starting from dead zero, like scratch. And so, so that was your introduction to the city coding. Oh and, yeah. And uh, that, was, that was our first. Yeah. we a sensed, sobering reality. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Were you full time by the, like before you signed that two year lease, were you still like dabbling in it and not really? Yeah, we weren't full time. I, I think it took two or three years for us to finally go full time into the business. So were you still doing music on the yeah. side? Okay. Yeah. Luckily like the touring gig I had, um, Ash really, Ash was doing less touring at that point, but my touring was pretty easy. Like we'd tour for a week or two out of the month and then be back home. And so it was manageable, but still trying to kind of pivot out. And it, it was really like a point where, like I said, we kind of set it up as a side business to start. And then when it started getting serious and we had to sit down and be like, I think we need to now really consider this as a full-time thing. And, and that's, we saw a huge inflection point once we, once we did that. I remember just as, as simple as setting up an office in our brewery, which we hadn't done yet. You know, we were working out of our apartment as soon as we even like put an office in and started going to work every day, you know, that that's when we saw like just a huge amount of momentum start. That's awesome. Was that hard though to not give up on music, but to stop touring and everything? Cause that, that's, that's yeah. a lifestyle. You know, you're not just like leaving one job and starting another You're You're leaving a lifestyle. Yeah. I don't, I mean, looking back, I, I don't feel like it was that difficult, you know, especially the, the gig I was doing at the time was a lot of international stuff. So there was one point where I was flying to China. I think I flew to China four out of four times in like two months or something, something like that, where it's wow. just like long flights. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very easy, a lot easier <laughs> to be like, I'm done, you know, I'm over yeah. this. And I think that's where I was at the, at the time. And, uh, Ashley's story is, you know, she was surprised. So Rihanna was re released the record, seven records in seven years. And uh, Ash was on the wave, you know, from the time Umbrella launched to the four years after. And they did not have a break. It would just be a, a world tour cycle and then another one and then another one because the record kind of, you know, is written while they're on the road and then recorded in, you know, a week and then wow. they're back on the road again. And so she was supposed to be, she got home for Christmas and was supposed to have I think two months of a break for the first time in a couple of years, probably. And, you know, on Christmas, they sent an itinerary and it was another 12 months of back to back dates. Like, so the break wasn't happening. So that was her kind of point of being like, I can't do it again. You know, so was Rihanna like, no, <laughs> you need to, you need to, I need to see you. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know about that, but it was certainly like uh, the time to move on. And, and I think a lot of people, understood you know because yeah. it's just uh, not for everybody uh, sure. long term yeah. yeah i've been a groupie for a little bit with our friends who are musicians in australia we did like four gigs with them in four days and uh, like i was just hanging out with them i'm like this is a lot it's a lot this is not and not a lot of people realize that you're only playing music one hour of the day you know yeah. there's a whole other 23 hours involved where you're almost like a professional traveler. Yeah. Like you're basically carting around your luggage and getting on airplanes and waiting for buses. And yeah. it's just like, that's what you're doing the majority of the time. Or you're sitting in a green room and they're not always nice. I mean, in Ashley's instance, they were like stadiums and they're, or the hockey arenas mm -hmm. and they're basically in a locker room, you know, for that, you know, they try to decorate, but it's, it's a smelly locker room at the end sure. of the day. And so, yeah you just start to realize like how you're spending your time, you know, and as much as you love the music portion and much as how gratifying that can be, it's the majority of your time and how that's being spent. And so I was also, I remember looking back, I was really jealous of my friend who had started a bar and I loved it because it was so tangible. Like you could go into the bar and you could see him behind the bar and he had this, you know, everything you could like touch and feel everything he was doing. And I like to say that touring was like this false sense of momentum because you're on the road, you're moving and it feels good at the time. And then you get home and it just like slams on the brakes and you're like, I have nothing to show for what I just did. I was just on the road, you know, like all, I was just here and there and everywhere, but like, I have nothing like, you're not I building could, equity or anything Yeah, I don't like, like have something to like show and even music. It's so digital now and everything. It's so it was very ethereal. All of it was very ethereal. And there was something about like just having something tangible 
that I think was drawing me to the beverage business because you can taste it and hold it and share it and yeah. it's you can you know it's just a real thing I, for whatever reason that was in my mind at the time that's i think that's how i felt about leaving tech it was like you, you, you we were in tech for so long and there's a part of you where at once you get to year seven that's when you really know if you're onto something but it takes like that full commitment and so when i moved to real estate development it was like so obvious it was exactly what you're saying it's like this isn't a technology that someone somewhere else can can either undercut me or do better. This is like an asset that's fixed and it's up to me to do whatever I want with it. Yeah. You know, it's like getting clay and I can form yeah. it however you want. And there was something easy about that. There was something that was like, this is great. And then the problem became, how do you solve for time while having real estate? Which it sounds like that's what you're solving for. You yes. got your time back. So it wasn't yeah. a money grab, which I think is smart for entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know, I think at some point that you realize that probably never works. That it never, never works. works. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, that's exactly right. And then you start solving for time and you get this clarity around that process. Yeah. And it sounds like you and your wife hit that at the same time. We which did, is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Did we, you guys ever raise capital or was this all bootstrapped? Yeah, so we, we did actually, uh, eventually. So we bootstrapped to almost $2 million in revenue with oh, our nice. $60,000 savings. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and really most of that good. savings went to the first facility. So it was a long grind. And we took every staircase step and we're still climbing, but I went from basically buying the bottles at the local shop, filling them myself with a picnic tap out of a keg and, you know, capping it off. We're in bottles to begin with. And then like loading those into my minivan, driving them, delivering them, you know, doing, I mean, literally doing everything, mopping the floors and, you know, growing one employee at a time from there. And we got some private label opportunity early on just given our quality and process and so we started to explore that side of the business mainly because we thought all right well this might be a way to hang on to our equity right and build out capacity and uh right. using you know non-dilutive growth capital right basically. right and you can scale yeah we can get some scale tab. out yeah. of it and and have someone else pay for it and we got we went down that road in a big way with a couple of really big companies and those were our first big we had two really major blitz scaling endeavors we just kind of had a third one, I guess, for a better booch. But we ended up building out a big team and a good amount of capacity. And then we saw that we were looking at the sales data after, you know, a year of doing this. And, you know, with these big companies in our face all the time, and there was, there was a lot of bureaucracy, you know, that we were getting burdened with. And um, we started looking at the sales data and saying, well, wait a second, our own brand, which was just like a regional brand at the time, was outselling both of the private label products we were doing five to one on the velocity side. So we were like, well, wait a second, you know, this is a lot of work to put into an underperforming product, you know? So that kind of led us to be like, well, we started out to do this for ourselves anyways. You know, we, we kind of had lost sight of that thinking longer term that we'd be able to expand more strategically if we in, and controlled, but just given the amount of work that, and focus that was going to someone else's brand, kind of made us be like, well, this is not what we set out to do. So that's when we said, okay, well, we need to phase out of co-packing, but we don't want to lose the team, you know, that we've just built and the, the, everything that we just kind of built out because as I put it, we kind of went through beverage boot camp, and I feel like our ops team, especially were like Navy SEALs after that. Cause we were, you know, we had to get all the certifications and do all the things and really invest into these people. And we didn't want to lose that. So that's when we were like, all right, we want to scale out and focus on better booch, but to supplement, we need to raise outside capital. And so that's the first time we, we did that. Wow. Which is about seven years. Into I business. almost would have thought you would have went the opposite where you're like, we have these huge co-packing deals. Let's raise capital based on known volume. Yeah. Right. Cause yeah. then it's more straightforward, but that makes more sense. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So here we are. We're actually, we phased that fully out of uh, private label as of October last year. So it's Better Booch full speed ahead. And we're almost doubled the volume out of our facility just with Better Booch than when we were doing three other lines. Was it straightforward in, in terms of educating the market on the product? Was it a lot of tastings? Oh, yeah. Was it like a brand building? So, oh, yeah. I remember very clearly the evolution of that because when we first started out, it felt like no one really knew what kombucha was. And we even, I think it was around 2014, we set up a booch bar, we called it, in the Grand Central Market here in downtown LA. It was like a, basically a kiosk, but it was a bar with taps. And it was kombucha on tap. No one had ever seen that. 
And we did it for a year. And over the course of that year, it was night and day. So when we first started there, it was like, what is kombucha? And, and I was behind the bar a lot. So I was you know, exp- explaining to people a lot what it was. Your and then pitch got really good. It I'm got sure. pretty good. But then by the end of the year, that was not happening almost at all. It was just people coming up being like, hey, I want Morning Glory. Hey, I want this. You know, It was either they were familiar with the brand or they were just familiar with kombucha. It, was just, it happened pretty fast over that course of the year. That's amazing. Do you ever do anything in the alcoholic realm? We've tinkered around with a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, right, You're right there. You're the same yeah. process. Yeah. It's a yeah. very similar process. You know, we have a whole library of innovation that we might bring to market, but right now our focus is very much on non alcoholic, better booch. Is it just a longer fermentation process to let the alcohol? Yes and no. So, a simple way to think of it is like that, where there's a secondary fermentation, usually with a different kind of yeast that's more alcohol producing. But the issue you find, especially with kombucha, is to get that secondary ferment, you have to add more sugar, which does get fermented away, but it then produces not only more alcohol, but more acid. So it's hard to find a hard kombucha that's not like too much of everything because now there's too much, now that there's a lot of alcohol, there's a lot, also a lot of acid. So to cover up the acid, they're adding a lot of juice and you know, it can become a very dense kind of flavor. So we did ultimately solve for that with our own product, but it's just not our focus right now. How often do you guys like try to roll out different, different versions, different tastes? Yeah. So one thing we initiated last year, that's been a really big success is our limited artist series. So it's a seasonal flavor. It rotates twice a year. So we launched last fall a flavor called Ginger Spice, and we had a local artist design the label. And then this fall, we launched a new one called Ginger Mate, and another artist designed the label. And uh, we have a new, we're actually bringing the flavor Ginger Spice back this fall because it was so successful, but we have a different design for it. And so that's kind of what we're doing right now, which to be honest, we wanted to do from day one, but, you know, finally getting the chance to do it. When it comes to marketing, how have you guys gone about that? So you've, if you started in 2010, you've seen all the social media channels, yeah, quite literally, and then you saw Instagram become the mainstream. Yeah, are you guys heavy into either influencer marketing or any of that, or is it just like the brand has? I mean, it's a memorable name, it's a memorable can, and so to some extent, you, I would imagine, you don't really need it. But we did. We we've gotten away with not doing much marketing for a very long time. I think in the last year, year or two, we've really been intentional about the marketing and. Luckily, there's a lot of UCG out there for the brand, like some user-generated content that we can repurpose, and it always looks really great. Um, But what we've tried to become on the marketing side, not only on social media, but on our website, is a resource for joy and a resource for health and wellness. So if you look at our feed, it's not all just people with cans, you know, and and the photo. We, We try to incorporate a lot of things that just uplift you, you know, during the day or maybe give you a break from other things you've seen on your feed. And on the website, we have our own blog and journal where we do a lot of interviewing of people with, you know, PhDs and and experts on health and wellness. And we just try to become a resource for people because we believe, you know, ultimately that Better Booch is on the spectrum of health and wellness, but it's not a panacea. It's not the only thing you need to do, right? Just like I would say, you know, alcohol has a place, you know, in moderation, right? But certainly on the spectrum, but it's a broad spectrum, and we think that if you're making intentional little decisions over time, it adds up in a big way, and you kind of have this flywheel. So Better Booch is just one choice you can make every day over something like a soda that helps keep the flywheel of health going. So that's, that's I think, the ultimate message we're trying to get across through our marketing, and I think it's been uh, pretty successful in the last couple of years. Yeah. How many of these do you drink a day? I drink probably two on average. And when do you do, you do it, like first thing in the morning? I do, well, usually I am a coffee guy uh, okay. right now, so I do have, I have two kids, so I have my <laughs> coffee boost in the morning, and then I usually have booch for lunch, and there's usually a, a can I'm grabbing off the line just for quality that I drink as well. So that's one of the benefits of having a brewery is you can just grab a fresh can right off the line and enjoy it. Will you ever open a tap room? So we would love to open a tap room. Do you think it's too much of a cultural shift for people? Like too well, much of a, question. where's that's, the alcohol that's been here? That's the question. I, I think now more than ever, it would be appealing to, to folks. There's I certainly agree. a, there is a trend towards low alk, no alk, sober mm-hmm. curious. Yeah. Um, to the point where I, like I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think people are, would be more open to something like that. In the past, it's been like, 
you know, what is the use occasion for folks to come to a kombucha bar rather than a normal bar or anything like that? So like in my mind, my dream, right, would be having the tap room as part of the brewery, you know, so that people can tour the brewery and see it. And LA, just, it's hard to do that. Like we're, we're currently down in Vernon, Huntington, like Vernon, there's only 70 people that live in that city. <laughs> so right. it's very industrial. Sure. Right. It's a lot of warehouses. It's not like a destination necessarily. Yeah. So it's hard to find the space. Like our next facility we're looking at is 50,000 square feet. So it's hard to find 50,000, you That's know, tough, yeah. uh, in LA that has that destination appeal. But I think it's possible that we'll find it in the next facility. Do we'll you guys see. deliver kegs to like offices or anything? We do. Yeah. A okay. lot of like, so Netflix, for example, yeah. all their corporate offices have better boots on tap right now. Cisco, okay. uh, Microsoft, there's a few others. Yeah. So it's, you could have like a tap room with just kegs, I guess. Not as exciting, but yeah. Um, or like a little microbrewery, you know, yeah. we could certainly have, right. we could do like special limited releases and stuff like that. Probably. Yeah. Well, that'd be super fun. Yeah. We should do that. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's funny from a real estate perspective. I was talking to a broker who was here this morning. There's like this concept of, he's like, what are you working on next? You know, it's his question to me all the time. And there's a part of me that given how COVID, given COVID, we, I'd have no idea. Like I know real estate has to become more flexible. How that looks, I have no idea. Yeah. I know people don't really want to be in the office as much. I don't see that. I don't see people going back to work. I just don't see that. I think with the technology we have in place today, people can, you don't need it. You can right. do Slack or Zoom. And if you can meet once or twice a week, I think that's fine. But I don't think a business is going to want to pay for that. But then there's this, also this movement around like no, like drinking less. Everyone's eating healthier, or at least they're aware. Uh, there's an awareness level around eating healthy. And so I'm like, what does that thing look like? And to me, I go back to this almost like a, there's a brewery component with alcohol. There's something like this, something that you're doing as a component. There's coffee as a component. Then there's food. So it's not, I don't want to call it a food hall, but it's basically like flex space that we can easily insert musicians and um, events, um, brand building events, or things that engage humans in a different way, but satisfy all the requirements. So it's a little bit for everybody. Yeah, make it remote work friendly during the day too, potentially. So, right, yeah. right, yeah, that's exactly right. But it's also like bringing new products. So it's not the pizza, the bar, you know, your your ramen. It's not that. It's like these are things that the new world has has gave us signals that they're interested in this movement. Yeah. And making that very approachable but fun from a real estate perspective. But I just don't know what it looks like. What well, seems like flexibility is the name of the game right yeah, there. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Do you need a certain license? You don't need a license, right? No. no. Okay. I mean, we just have a, we, we follow the FDA kind of cert- certifications, basically. Based on your data, where is like an ideal location for you to do this concept? Um, well, it would certainly be in L.A. You know, I, L.A. is still the epicenter for something like kombucha. I would say we're probably sitting in it i mean honestly like west, west hollywood, hollywood would yeah. probably be kind of an ideal location and it's interesting your point because not a lot of small businesses have the resources to risk something like that right to put into its own their own thing just to like test out so it's a great proving ground a proof of concept kind of flexibility idea if that you mentioned for smaller brands right that that's can, exactly it yeah yeah it makes it safe and approachable and it's not it's this massive commitment per se right well if la is the epicenter so to speak are there other areas around the country that are growing in, in terms of their kombucha consumption? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say LA, San Diego, NorCal, they're all big on kombucha, but the Pacific Northwest also a close second. Interestingly enough, New York, not surprisingly, is also up there. But when we look at our top 10 cities, so for us personally, one of our top 10 cities is Philadelphia. And that was a little bit surprising to me. So you are seeing it, I think, broaden a bit. If you look at the sales data of kombucha in general, Florida is in the top 10 of, as far as states go. So that's kind of interesting as well. So it's not... Uh, it Florida, is Florida, getting things right after all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're allowed one. <laughs> it's still very coastal, you know. Sure. And I grew up in Indiana, so my mission has been to try to make a kombucha that appeals more to the Midwest, especially, and can kind of infiltrate more of the country. Yeah. And by doing that, we try to make it very approachable try to make the flavor not taste weird, you know, and, and, yeah. Yeah, it and make great. it something that you want to crave, you know, you, that you crave instead of you, you know, have to drink kind of thing. So yeah. that's been our mission. And, and I, I am hopeful that we will start seeing those states, you know, adopt kombucha more and more. What's big picture for you guys? Do you want to keep expanding your, your product line into different things or is it, 
acquisition? What, what's kind of your ideal, the way you play out the next five years of your life? Yeah. How do you so think about I that? I personally think that kombucha is nowhere near its full potential. And I do think that it's about a billion dollar category right now. Um, half of which is tied up in one brand who's been around for 25 years doing it, almost doing like a homebrew method. And I would say that their brand and product is particularly polarizing to most people. Um, either people love it, which I get, or they won't, they won't touch it. And that's kind of concerning, you know, for the category, in my opinion. And so, uh, first of all, going back to the philosophy of how it should be brewed, I have a differing opinion on that thinking, you know, I'm a big believer should stay very tea forward and stay, be a smooth drinking experience. And so I think that inherently that will adopt more people uh, and attract more people into the category. As long as the education piece is there and people can understand why they should be drinking kombucha and, oh, it's like not a, they're not settling to incorporate that or make that choice in their day, which I don't think with better booch they are. So I think that that will take time to prove out, but you know, there's studies after study, after study, uh, especially coming out, there's one last week from Stanford that was basically comparing fermented foods like a kombucha versus other products that are just like high in fiber. Cause that's another big trend. And what they found was the high in fiber didn't do a whole lot for biodiversity, but the fermented foods also had a lot to do with biodiversity and also decreased inflammation markers. So that's the big, I mean, Things that we've believed in and known inherently over the years are becoming are getting finally proved out through clinical research, and I think the more that that happens, the more people understand why they should drink something like a kombucha. And uh, this day and age, like who doesn't have an issue with inflammation, right? Like I think yeah, yeah, I think totally. like it, it, how easy can, are we solving that by making better booch something to just pick over a soda? You know, so I think when you do that, you're talking about the soda market, which is 250 billion. So literally 250 times the kombucha side market. So I really do believe kombucha is just in the very early innings. And I think it will take a brand like Better Booch to broaden the category. We can't do it ourselves probably, but it'll certainly take products like ours to help, you know, expand and attract new people into the category. So I'd like to see that through, you know, I want to see, I would like to see kombucha reach its full potential. The brewery we're opening, they have a naturally fermented uh, beer essentially. And so they go back to like the old world Belgian style methods Yeah, and people drink and they go, Oh, this doesn't make me feel bloated or, you know, and it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it takes a lot longer to make, right? but it's also very clean. And then people go, so you mean beer is processed and it's like heavily actually, yeah. um, at scale. Yeah. And know? the gluten elements, especially like, yeah. you know, some of the, yeah. Yeah. The control over a lot of that gets lost. I learned from our brewmaster that beer came out of, uh, unsafe water did yeah. you know that yeah <laughs> you had beer. alcohol in general yeah, yeah in general yeah, yeah. that's water why was... you know in the time of jesus they yeah they, turning water into wine was essential because you couldn't trust the water yeah <laughs> exactly yeah and they made everyone feel good there's actually a lot of philosophies on that there's a i guess there's a lot of thought around people should continue to drink just because we've been like a little bit a day, right? Just yeah. like throughout the day, it's actually pretty okay to yep. have some alcohol because that's what we've been accustomed to. Yep. And a little bit. I mean, a little, a little bit, bit yeah. can be a nutrient uh, transmitter basically in your body. And it can help, it can also help extract and make things more bioavailable, mm-hmm. like different, like even polyphenols that are in our teeth, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, we're, we're believers that, you know, in moderation, it does hold a place. I also want to talk about your podcast that you put on our radar. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 What made you want, when did you start your podcast? Well, I didn't start this podcast actually. So interestingly enough, so this goes back to when I was on tour and I was just, I had a lot of downtime, especially sitting on a tour bus and stuff. You, you just kind of like, you start thinking like, well, how can I make more money? I'm just sitting here. So I got interested (laughs) in the stock market. You know, this is like hard to tie back to kombucha to see. Sure. Yeah. We're taking a left. (laughs) Yeah. We're taking a left. (laughs) That's okay. Yeah. But interestingly, I started learning about the, the stock market and, uh, it was something I had no idea about. And I don't really come from a family that's very, you know, that's just not how they think. And so I started going down the rabbit hole on that. And through sheer happenstance, through a family friend, I had this opportunity to have dinner with Warren Buffett. And uh, really like a, random. Like a one-on-one really dinner? Ser- or it like, was like a group like of folks. Small, yeah. I got like one or two questions in, you know. Yeah. But it was a totally serendipitous moment. And so... 
he likes to say that he's a better businessman because he's an investor and a better investor because he's a businessman. So I saw it as sort of like this positive feedback loop about the more I started learning about investing, I would start, I would really recognize uh, in my own company what was making it better or, or not. And so as a, as the founder and leader of the company, it was almost like just my educational side of the business to, to keep tying what I'm learning back into the business. So through that, I found a website at the time called Buffett's Books because I was really big on Buffett at the time. Uh, still am. But these two guys who started this website, it just had a free course on it. And I did the course. And then the day I finished the course, they launched a podcast. And um, I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'll check it out. And this is like five or six years ago. And I started just listening to the show on my commute once a week when it came out. And so you know, over time, I started doing things like going to Omaha to the Warren Buffett, you know, Berkshire Hathaway meeting every year. That's like the Woodstock of business. And I started meeting the guys on the podcast and, and going to their events and getting to know them. So it's just a show I've listened to for five or six years. And it's since then become the number one investing show in the world. And they have billionaires on the show like Howard Marks and Bill Miller and all these really amazing people on it. And so about six months ago, actually about eight months ago now, Preston, the founder of the show, he has gone really all in on Bitcoin. So he wanted to release a fully Bitcoin focused show. And so that opened up a slot on the main show. And they asked me to, if I'd consider hosting it. And I was just like, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of a dream uh, of mine that I kind of didn't really think about too much, but like, cause I didn't really think that was an option, but it's already afforded me all these amazing opportunities. I've interviewed, you know, Chamath Palhapatia and Jeremy Grantham and, you know, even like Bing Gordon, who's, you know, the founder of EA Sports and on the board of Amazon. And, and I'm just getting, like this week I interviewed Jim Collins. So if you're oh, nice. familiar with like sure. Good to Great, Built yeah. to Last. So wrapped with Jim Collins for like two and a half hours. I mean, it was like, it's just presenting these amazing opportunities that again, I'm taking and putting back into my own business and it's forcing me, it's like a forcing mechanism to continue to learn. And it's just been a really great thing that I do on the weekend. But how did you get on their radar? Like you said, you were a fan of the show. You listened to the podcast. How did you even get on their radar to be on the short list for potential hosts? Yeah. Well, funny enough, um, I had met them at a couple of events and connected. They actually invested in better booch at one okay. point in one of our rounds. So they were, you know, very familiar with who I am, Gotcha. but I literally had to apply like anybody else. And so I emailed them and remember, I mean, I remember talking to my wife and she was, I was, cause look, I'm a college dropout. I, I'm not like, I don't have like an MBA. I didn't work at Goldman Sachs. I'm not like an investing guru in like a traditional way. But what I did bring to the table in my mind was a very deep understanding of how Warren Buffett invests. Cause I've studied it for a long time. And I did come from the entertainment world. So I do have some, you know, familiarity with yeah. talking and you can have the conversation. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. being f familiar with people. And so I thought I was kind of uniquely qualified. And so I threw my hat in the ring and, uh, you know, I did everything from having to submit like an intrinsic value assessment of a stock and things like that. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of went from there. So I, I, apparently I built, I a beat out a professor from Harvard. Uh, they told me so at some point. Nice. So you, you know, were probably think, more interesting. I, 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 don't, I, I, I think I, you know, if I had to, and you have practical knowledge. I think that's something that gets. I think lost. that's all it is. Yeah. I think it's, that was the appeal. Was like our listeners are not very academic either. Right. Like they're they're usually people who have made some good money, but they don't like they're look trying to learn like I am. You're one of them. You're I'm honest. kind of one of them. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was just the appeal was, you know, that's a Trey's smart dumb call enough on their to, part. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. frankly, no, to be honest, I mean, that's, that's a tough decision that I think the optics could be, oh, really? But yeah. in some way they were looking at the bigger picture. Warren Buffett, I would say I credit all his books, Warren Buffett Wealth and a whole bunch of them and Charlie Munger on like my financial understanding. Yeah. To be honest, like I was not, no one around me in my family knew finance. We had moved here from Peru. So I had like nobody that had, I could point to and say, oh, this person made money right. investing in, in anything other than survival, right? Yep. And so there was like nothing on the table. And I would just like, this is why I don't read fiction, I think. I'm all nonfiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so you mentioned all the authors I'm very yeah. familiar with. And I've just like read all those books. And since I was 10, I was just like naturally interested. And uh, I literally credit a lot of my own financial IQ with those books. Yeah. It gave me a window. And yeah. as a real estate developer, I'm like, oh, this is, you know, it helps. It helps. 
but there's a natural curiosity and I think that's honest yeah. and that's probably what people connect to is my guess when they hear you and I, your I'm, story. I, you know, whether this is true or not, I like the belief that investing is 5% intelligence or knowledge and 95% just temperament and, you know, psychology. So I try to, I try to focus on that. Like the information is available to almost everyone. It's just a lot of that buy and hold stuff, especially it's just about temperament. That's totally true. Everyone wants to make a quick buck yeah. and that's not how things operate. Unfortunately. Yeah. I'm just looking for the next stock that's going to the moon. Yeah. Like, Nick, exactly. Nick, yeah. Nick, the other day, what did what this was a while back? You were like, "Hey, did you buy uh, GameStop?" GameStop, and I was like, "Absolutely not." Yeah, I was like, "What are you talking about?" And then and then we ended up in this debate, and I was like, "Do it again." I'm like, "What have you learned?" Yeah, <laughs> what have you learned yeah, exactly. other than you go on Twitter? How do you replicate that? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. stop. I'm like, stop. I'm like, if you can do it twice, I'm a fan and I'll commit to learning. But yeah. if you can't then it's so silly. Yeah. What you said earlier, though, about podcasting affording you opportunities that you wouldn't have, like, I, I know this is a little bit meta talking about this on a podcast, but it, it is so true and hit pretty close to home for, for me because you're not aware when you first start podcasting like of, of where it's going to take you, but it's afforded us the opportunities to meet with cool people like yourself and just have conversations and just really enrich our knowledge in in a field that we are interested in so like no matter what your podcast is about as long as you are a curious individual you will go so many places that you'd never dreamed and i think that's really cool to to hear your opinion of that as well because it's very much what the the spirit that we embody on this show as well the way like from what i've read or learned from other folks success really boils down to persistence, you know, on the business side. And then on the leadership side, it seems like if you ask anyone who's successful, um, like what makes a successful leader, they're usually like, well, they're continuous learners. That's it. That's basically, it's those types of folks who are ultimately successful because they just have a, I mean, even Warren Buffett, who's in his early nineties is still spends most of his day reading and studying. I mean, he, and same with Charlie. So, you know, I think that those two principles are kind of the building blocks for doing anything great. I think podcasting is like the ultimate shortcut, at least for me. Like as much as like uh, whenever I talk to founders, it feels like therapy. It's also like if I do, if I don't know anything about your world, oh, yeah. that's just like a ton of inform a fire hose of information. Yeah, and it's wonderful. And afterwards, I always feel better. I'm like, oh, now I know a little bit about that. That's pretty cool. Like yesterday, we were talking to a therapist about they're using ketamine now to to or like. To treat a anxiety process to treat depression. anxiety and depression and it's working and it's having all of these fabulous uh, there's data and they're creating science and th the taboo is kind of getting removed and so he feels like he's riding you know like the aol bubble in that space sure. and he's just so jazzed up every day to go to work and as a psychiatrist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be talking about innovation is really it's interesting yeah it's interesting yeah there's been a lot of instances where to be honest like some of the folks we have Maybe I know who they are, but I don't know much about them before like a day or two before the interview. And it's so funny to go from that to after the interview, yeah. because not only have I done the prep, but then having the conversation, it's like, wow, I have a deep, I have a very good understanding of this person that I didn't before. And that always feels really good. That's so true. Are there any gems that you like one, two things that you think about the most from your time interviewing these individuals? Um, that's a good question. You mentioned the leadership one. I mean, that one was great. You mentioned also the business one, you know, how being an investor really makes you a better business person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a hard learning. Yeah. Um, but it's legitimate. Yeah. It's well, what I would say, if anything is that, and I had the same experience with meeting Warren Buffett, what stood out to me so much from that dinner and what I'm, what's continuously reinforced with this podcast is that they're just people. You know, like you, you see or hear about these folks, like even Jim Collins, he's a legend. And he and I rapped for like two and a half hours. Like we had probably spent an hour outside of the recording, you know, just talking. And so that is so cool to have someone genuinely curious about you and vice versa. And you, you go back and go, oh, wow, this person was just like an idea in my mind. They're now a living human being that is flawed and funny or whatever, you know, all these things that... And being around Buffett like that made success like that feel more tangible. And that's kind of the, the other takeaway is like, oh, you did it. 
so I can do it. Or like, you know, it's, it's just that constant re, Were you ever like, that. you did it and you're really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, my wife says that to me every day. Yeah. <laughs> no. no, no, I'm kidding. I, uh, no, there's, there's honestly everyone I've luckily interviewed so far has been incredibly like beyond brilliant. So there is obviously a reminder that you're a mere mortal here and there, but just seeing them in the flesh is like enough to be like, Oh wow. Okay. So you're just a human. You yeah. Know? That's really cool. I also love what it could do for your business. I mean, to some way, right? Those, yeah, there's a lot of parallels Those connections that get fostered. Anytime but, you need yeah. investment, I'm sure you have at minimum the right advice or yeah. advisors yep. that can help you, um, solve any problems, whether it be financial or otherwise. Have you leaned on any of these billionaires that you've met for advice? No, I do. I ship them a case as a thank you, you know? Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of them, in. a lot of them get back to me and say that they really loved it. You know, I know Chamath drinks a lot of kombucha, for example, and he and I talked about that. I haven't leaned on them in that way, but I have had a couple reach out about like connecting if I, if I need advice on stuff. So that does, you know, has presented itself to be potentially helpful in the future. Well, let's end on what's next for Better Booch. Yeah. So what's next for Better Booch? Uh, we are expanding in a big way. So we just launched nationally in Sprouts and we just launched also in Walmart, uh, and just got expanded from a hundred doors to 500 doors there. And that kind of ties back to that mission of, you know, entering the Midwest a bit more as well. And, um, you know, everyone lives 10 miles from a Walmart, so Mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. good place to be. And in the meantime, we think that we can be within, within arm's reach more in California as well. So uh, actually California has been a huge focus of ours and will be for the next six months. Just, you know, we're looking at our top stores and what makes them so great. And it's usually because better booch is found and the radius around it, you know, pretty heavily. And so we're trying to replicate that. Makes that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we talk about making kombucha more approachable, especially to the Midwest market. Walmart is a huge inroad to that. I mean, you think about like, yeah, you're in Whole Foods and Sprouts and those, those are great stores to be in. But if you're, if you're that person who shops at Walmart, you might not even step foot in a Sprouts or Whole Foods. Yeah, it's totally different. And we actually, you know, in some ways, I think that Better Booch is built for that more conventional mass channel. Like we are, we did just launch in Ralph's uh, this last week. And I'm, I'm really curious to see how that does. It's a more conventional channel and conventional shopper is the, you know, industry term. But the fact that we're at a lower price point and that we're in a can and that we're a very, a, a clean label and all of these things, I think, potentially present themselves as a, as a vehicle to, you know, get adoption from those customers. And so that's the thesis. So I'm curious to see if that plays out. We've already done really well in the natural channels, like you mentioned. And I think you have to win there first. I do think, I think you got to have the, the fans out of natural to be your, you know, cheerleaders. But um, I am curious to see if we connect in other, in other channels. And, and so far we've seen it happen in Walmart and we'll see if that continues. How much is it? Uh, usually two ninety nine. Oh, nice. Yeah. And most retailers it's two ninety nine. So super affordable. Yeah. And, it's not that it's any less premium or any less potent than any other kombucha. It's just that the can helps us afford a lower price point. Sure. And we arbitrarily discounted that much as well just to reach more people. So could you ever get to a point where you can create a concentrate and then add water? To I was it thinking of that too. It's like pilot plants th- scattered around the country. Yeah. So that is doable. And, you know, we've, again, like we've innovated a lot. We don't use that approach. Some brands do. And what we've found with it is that it doesn't work unless you're adding juice, which again, we're not big believers in because when you dilute it like that, it's just very empty. You know, it's an empty body. It's basically just like acid and water. And so you have to kind of build the body back with things like juice. And a lot of brands do that. A lot of brands have been successful with that. You also are diluting obviously the probiotic benefit. And so a lot of brands do that and then they add powdered probiotic into it. All these things are just more of a formulaic approach that we're just not big believers in because I didn't get in, again, going back to it, I didn't really get get into kombucha to like, you know, just build a big beverage brand. I I got into it because I really believed in the effect of it. So I don't want to, you know, tamper with the effect of it, (laughs) Sure, you know, with our product. Well, thanks for coming on, man. This is a blast. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Tell everyone it. where they can find you and, and your podcast. Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, check out Better Booch. It's betterbooch.com. Instagrams, you know, all the channels are 
platforms are slash better booch and booch is spelled b-o-o-c-h and then yeah if you want to find me i'm at you know i'm slash trey lockerby on twitter and the podcast is called we study billionaires it's on the investors podcast network so you can go to the investors and find it there well thanks appreciate a lot trey it. yeah thank you no, it's a pleasure i really appreciate it